there is reason to rejoice. I hope that we're setting a really strong standard that people are going to follow. As we look to the past to celebrate the future of black history. Yes, you are not alone. Fighting stereotypes and perceptions. Because if not now, then when? And opening new doors and opportunities for the underrepresented in our community. We're putting the league on notice. As Western Washington gets real about your voices. Hi, everybody. I'm Monique Minglavin. Western Washington Gets Real is Cairo 7's commitment to having difficult conversations about systemic racism beyond just highlighting where or how racism exists. This is a chance to learn from each other and create a greater understanding. Tonight, you'll see how Seattle's newest hockey team plans to create the league's most diverse clubhouse. Plus, we'll introduce you to the marine scientists making waves in and outside of the lab. But we begin today with a push to to convince skeptics that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe. Kyra Sevens Deborah Horn spoke with a highly regarded African-American doctor who's doubling down on that message to the BIPOC community. How has it affected you when you see what happens to people of color in the medical system? At times it's, it's frustrating. Dr. John Vassell has had an esteemed career. University of Washington Medical School graduate, chief medical officer at Swedish Hospital for eight years. Still, he has witnessed the stigma of race in healthcare up close, beginning at the start of his career in Georgia. And it was very difficult to, to even make that voice heard. And the impact, he says, goes far beyond the infamous Tuskegee experiment on unsuspecting African-American men stricken with syphilis. I think many people African-American people have had bad, adverse experiences with, the, with their health care providers, systems, and the health care system. But the death of George Floyd, the racial unrest that followed, all of it in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, has forced change in the medical community, too. It is really the first time in my career, and mine has been a long one, that we are openly talking about racism in medicine. It has not come up, and yet when we go back and look, it's always been there. And now that same medical community is in the midst of a steep challenge, convincing at least 70% of Americans to take the coronavirus vaccine. A steeper challenge still, perhaps, persuading those who are not white. But the effort to convince people of color that the vaccine is safe actually began months ago. In fact, a public health expert here at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center was a part of this first ever effort to make sure that people of every race participated in the vaccine trials to ensure that the vaccines would be safe for all to take. I mean, I've been in public health for over 30 years and I just think it's amazing to see this much effort and this much focus on um, inclusion. Dr. Michelle Andrasik is a staff scientist in Fred Hutch's Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division. She calls the effort to include people of every race in the vaccine trials unprecedented. This pandemic is black, is brown, is white. And the multifaceted campaign to achieve that, she says, has worked. More people of color participated in the coronavirus vaccine trials than oh any God. other. Thank you. But this, she says, is only the start. The vaccine itself isn't going to do anything. It's getting vaccinated <laughs> that will do something that will really make the difference. You took yours. I did. So, Dr. Vasso, what is your message then to people who are hesitant, no matter their race, their gender, or whatever their circumstances are, in taking this vaccine? My first message, just so that people are clear, is you should take the vaccine. The coronavirus has proved so deadly for so many, especially people of color, he says. Take those precautions that you need to take to avoid getting disease. Because the best thing, of course, is not to get it. And the way we do that, of course, is to wear face coverings, to keep a social distance, to wash your hands frequently, and to get the vaccination. And that's really the only way we're going to wrestle this thing to the ground is with the vaccination. A message he is sending out to everyone in Seattle, Deborah Horn, Cairo 7 News. Over the past couple weeks, we've seen significant progress getting seniors vaccinated. Pop-up clinics have been targeting the most at-risk populations. That includes Seattle's Central District. As Cairo 7's Allison Grandy reports, it was 
quite the celebration as hundreds gathered at the first AME church to get their vaccines. There is reason to rejoice in Seattle's central area. It's okay to have the COVID shot. Tell them what you want. Today, 400 seniors got vaccinated for COVID-19, thanks to help from the Central Area Senior Center. Uh, they have not been able to get their vaccinations because they don't know how to maneuver the system that will get them a spot. These seniors did not have to struggle online to sign up. Today, we are leaving no seniors behind. The pop-up clinic at First African Methodist Episcopal Church had pharmacists from Safeway and Albertsons ready to vaccinate seniors. It's nice to come somewhere where they feel safe, it's familiar to them, and then they're able to get their vaccination. This is the kind of clinic the state is focusing on. We're concerned about disproportionate impacts of this pandemic. Uh, so we have been uh, consciously trying to bring as much equity as possible. At first, hospitals had 70% of the vaccine. Now it's dropped to 20%, allowing pop-up clinics and mass vaccination sites to increase capacity. Now we need to spread our limited vaccine supply to more sites across the state to help people have easier access to vaccine. In the last two weeks, the state has doubled the number of vaccinations each day from about 14,000 to 28,000. So many African American people and people of color have died from COVID-19. And it's not just the elderly, those over 65 that have passed due to it, but it's the generation behind them. Today, there was a room where seniors could ask questions, get help filling out forms, and see friends they haven't seen in a year safely from six feet apart. It was very smooth, very easy, and the shot was over before I knew it. And when it was time to be observed after the shot, they sang. I am happy and feeling safe. Tell them what you want. A Seattle marine scientist is making waves, not just with her research, but also by helping to connect black scientists. Kyra Sevens Matthew Smith explains how she's creating a worldwide network and inspiring the next generation to chase their dreams. I'm just looking like. Before she ever hit send on Twitter, Dr. Moore had no idea that this video. I use environmental DNA um, to conduct ecosystem biodiversity. Announcing the first ever Black and Marine Science Week would reach thousands of people. And I think I even tweeted, I'm like, I'm in tears. Like, I knew we existed, but I didn't know the reach. This is what a scientist looks like um, because I am a scientist. You don't always see the Black Marine scientists that are here. Um, on TV or in the spotlight. I really hope that this week can inspire other black students and black scientists to join this field. Videos began pouring in from all over the country. Black scientists held panels. I am a scuba diver as well. Hundreds of people tuned in, including some aspiring scientists like Addie. I've been wanting to dive. Oh, and at 12 years old, she's pretty driven. It's really exciting to see all the black marine biologists out there to know I'm not alone. Yes, you are not alone. It was like heartwarming and heartbreaking because it was like, what if this happens to me and how am I going to like process through it? Eddie's talking about facing racism. You see, Moore has earned a doctorate. She's worked in the field around the world and in the lab. So here are all the samples that we just ran. She's put in the work. Yet even when presenting research at a conference, she says it's not unusual for someone to mistake her for the help. Maybe it's all a coincidence, right? How about this one? Late at night, she's on campus heading into her science lab. Somebody sees her behind him and they slam the door shut. It's actually happened multiple times. Heck, some people have even asked her if she can swim. Yeah, because she's black. I feel honestly defeated because it's like, dang, I worked this hard and I still don't belong here. I work this hard and they're still closing the door in my face. I work this hard and they're still asking me to go get coffee. <laughs> you know? That field talks in educational panels. And frankly, Dr. Moore realized she wasn't alone. While students like Addie saw how black scientists are overcoming it. It might be a bit shocking, but it was kind of nice to hear what they um, kind of did during that situation. Oh my goodness, you're going to make me cry. I know that we are out here working for you so you don't have to deal with the stuff that I have and that you will be able to focus 
on just being a scientist. Thank you. To be clear, they're talking about science, too. In fact, the week was such a hit, Black and Marine Science is now becoming a nonprofit and a weekly YouTube educational series. They call it BIMS Bites. Sea turtles, for example, sometimes eat plastic bags because they look like jellyfish. It's a chance to get the voices of black scientists into the mainstream, really to change the narrative. Yes, black scientists exist, though Dr. Moore tells me creating that opportunity can distract from her science work. She's not done. In fact, she's even branched off into environmental sciences, working to restore old growth forests in Washington, using some of those same skills she's picked up from marine science. Think about any crime show you may have seen. There's like a criminal and they'll like, you know, leave a fingerprint or something and the detectives will come in, you know, get that DNA and say, oh, this is who it is. So basically I can do that in the environment. Because of fighting for a seat at the table and working in the ocean isn't enough, Dr. Moore still has plans to do more. Put it in your, your schedule. <laughs> Dr. Moore says before she started speaking about all this, she nearly got out. But at some point, there was a decision. She could deal with the systemic racism. She could quit or try to change it. So that's what she's doing now. If you want to check out her science or the work that she's doing with BIMS Bites, check out our website after the show and look for this story. Matthew Smith, Cairo 7 News. Coming up, diversifying the department. Cairo 7 gets real about Washington State Patrol's push to revamp its recruitment. It is utterly important for us here at Washington State Patrol to fix the problem. Plus, we're months away from professional hockey in Seattle, but that is not stopping the Kraken from lighting the lamp. We want to fix it, and we want to make sure that everybody can find their place and their voice in, their, in this game. We'll explore the end goal in creating the most diverse staff in the National Hockey League. Tonight, we're examining a push to diversify the Washington State Patrol. Troopers in our state are predominantly white men. Camera 7 Simney Kim shows you what the agency is doing to recruit and change the department's demographics. After a summer of protests demanding racial justice, law enforcement agencies like Washington State Patrol are facing their own reckoning of a department that doesn't reflect the people of the state. Consequences are huge, uh, starting with um, relationship building with the community and overall trust. Amandeep Puri is WSP's new diversity, equity and inclusion officer. She was hired specifically to look at the agency's hiring practices, policies and determine ways to increase minority recruitment. It is utterly important for us here at Washington State Patrol uh, to fix the problem. We've been working on it for years. Uh, but we are also fighting several stereotypes and perceptions, uh, the, the perceptions like it is just a white man agency. Is it fair to say that some of those criticisms are correct, though? Because when you look at the agency as it is right now, it is primarily a white male dominated agency. It is. It is. There is no doubt about that, that there is a problem and we've been working on it. Chief John Batiste is the first black chief of the state patrol. He's been in charge of the agency since 2005, but even under his leadership, there's been little diversifying of the department. According to WSP, commissioned troopers who are people of color grew slightly from about 12 and a half percent in 2011 to almost 14 and a half percent in 2020. The number of black troopers went from about two and a half percent to almost three percent. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, blacks make up almost four and a half percent of the state. There were three and a half percent Hispanic troopers. It's gone up to almost five percent, far less than the 13 percent in the state. Asians and Pacific Islanders made up about four and a half percent of the force. Now that number is almost five percent, less than half of the almost ten and a half percent in Washington. The number of Native Americans in WSP dropped from just over 2% to about 1.5%. They make up almost 2% of the state. The growth is not as much as we would like to see, but there is growth. We're not doing enough. We're not doing it right. 
and that it's time. Back in 2011, women made up almost 7.5% of the force. Today, that number is a little more than 9.8%. We need to. Which is why State Representative Sharon Wiley co-sponsored last year's bill, which among some of the provisions, calls for WSP to research why women and minorities are underrepresented on the force and how to better recruit them. I think that we need to reimagine what law enforcement is and how you talk about law enforcement to children as they're growing up. The last class to graduate from the WSP Academy in Shelton was made up of 40% women and minorities, an improvement over the last two classes, which are certainly a far cry from State Patrol's earliest days. This is the first known photo of the force in 1922, a year after the agency formed. Would it be fair to say that increasing the diversity wasn't previously a priority at WSP? I would not say that, but yes, it is much more uh, in focus right now. That includes revamping its entire recruiting program. We just hired three new recruiters uh, who are specifically working on building a relationship of trust with the communities which are traditionally underrepresented. The agency also hired an independent diversity consultant. We know that there is a, there is a problem and we need to break several barriers and stereotypes, uh, but we are willing to work on it and we acknowledge uh, that there is a lot of work to do. But they can't do it alone. Anyone who, who is thinking about uh, changing the face of law enforcement should think about a career with us and uh, be a part of the change because if not now, then when? Simney Kim, Cairo 7 News. Here's your license. Washington State Patrol tells Cairo 7 they want to add 60 new troopers and 24 commercial vehicle enforcement officers between now and June and the next academy starts in July. We are still months away from dropping the puck on center ice, but the Seattle Kraken organization is already focusing on creating one of the most diverse NHL staffs in the sport. The goal is to create a more welcoming experience for its fans, players, and staff. Camera 7's Tracy Leong explains how they're aiming for diversity on and off the ice. The Seattle Kraken's goal is to lead the way in diversity, equity and inclusion. For us, we realize that there are parts of the NHL and a part of the culture of the NHL that may be a bit broken and we want to fix it and we want to make sure that everybody can find their place and their voice in, their, in this game. And it starts with giving uh, the fans an organization, a front office that they can be proud of. The Kraken's play-by-play -play announcer, Everett Fitzhugh, is the first black NHL team broadcaster, making history before the puck drops on their inaugural season. Hockey is a predominantly white sport, and it's a sport that sort of feels like it, it has a gate around it, and it's not super accessible to people who don't look like the people that are playing it. And it's important to make a very conscious effort to make your, your um, team as diverse as possible, and I hope that we're setting a really strong standard that people are going to follow. The team's corporate communications manager, Deara Anderson, is proud to be with an organization that focuses on racial diversity through their hiring and community initiatives to break gender and racial barriers. We have leadership that looks to us to talk about those experiences and it makes it um, even that more uh, accessible to make those business decisions where it's like, hey, maybe we should invest in a person of color. The Kraken is also the first NHL team to join the Black Girl Hockey Club's anti-racism campaign to create a welcoming space for BIPOC hockey players and fans. Hi, Seattle Kraken fans. They recently released a co-branded beanie to fund the group's scholarship program. Bring the initiatives in-house, and they're not just one person's responsibility, but all of our responsibilities. And in line with that, we have uh, you know, team and organization-wide metrics and, and initiatives that we measure ourselves against. Kendall Tyson is the Kraken's Vice President for Strategy and Business Intelligence. She believes the team's three-ring training facility at Northgate will provide incredible opportunities for the younger generation that would not typically have access to the sport. The practice center will be open to the public, giving the team a space to invest in youth hockey programs. The representation really matters. So seeing people like Kendall, seeing people like Fitz, and breaking the ground into these uh, roles, it can really affect the younger generation and affects everybody. Now it's like, shows like, hey, 
I can do that as well. Zach Pagans is the Kraken social media specialist. As the team's second employee hired, he's seen the importance they've put on inclusion since the beginning. We're putting the league on notice. You know, I, I know that there have been teams reaching out and have said, how are they doing this? How do you guys do this? You know, how are you able to put such a, a, a premium and, and, and such a huge emphasis on diversity and, and things like that? And because it's the right thing to do. Tracy Leong, Cairo 7 News. Coming up next, the pandemic has kept the curtains closed on McCaw Hall. But one dancer is still finding ways to break down barriers. I had to like put myself in a very vulnerable state. It's hard for a lot of queer youth to be their truest self. When Western Washington Gets Real returns. The pandemic has kept the curtains closed at McCaw Hall, home of the Pacific Northwest Ballet, but a gender fluid dancer there is still finding ways to break barriers. We end tonight with Cairo 7's DD Sun, showing us how Ashton Edwards is helping transform the future of ballet. Eighteen-year-old Ashton Edwards from Flint, Michigan, is a professional division student at the Pacific Northwest Ballet. He's been dancing since preschool. I always like dreamed of being a professional ballet dancer. Now he's the first ever male student to be formally studying on point here. It's a classical ballet technique where dancers are on their toes, feet vertical. The form makes dancers seem weightless and ethereal. The role is traditionally reserved for women. To float around the stage while the men kind of just assisted them. The technique on display here with the sugar plum fairy in the nutcracker. It's a lot more challenging in certain ways. Um, the girls make it look so easy. Um, it's a lot more, um, there's more of the smaller muscles. Ashton didn't come to Seattle to study point. He tells me it's a path he started on after coming out last year. It definitely took some time and a lot of courage. It was definitely really hard. I came out to my family as a gay man. He's since discovered he identifies with other groups too. He, him, she, her, they, them. I haven't like changed any labels yet, but I'm still learning and exploring myself. Challenging personal boundaries pushed the limits of this love, ballet. I kind of had like this self-realization that I could do more and I didn't want to limit myself in any way. And that brought him onto his toes. Ashton's the first student that has come to us and said, I'd like to study on point. Is that possible? Um, and I, I didn't really see it coming. Peter Bull is the artistic director at Pacific Northwest Ballet. Ballet is not really known as being the most progressive <laughs> of art forms. Ashton says he knew starting that discussion, wanting to tackle a role created for women, meant challenging an age-old tradition. Were you nervous at all to have that conversation with Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, um... It was very nerve-wracking. What motivated Ashton was not his own ambition. I knew it was bigger than me from the beginning. I had to like put myself in a very vulnerable state. Um, it's hard for a lot of queer youth to be their truest self, especially for so long we're like told we're not supposed to be these things and not supposed to be ourselves. Peter's reaction to the request? I was grateful that someone stepped forward and said, I'm ready, I'm interested, can this happen? Peter was 100% on board. He says the first thing they had to do was go through the student handbook to make sure it doesn't say women studying on point, but simply students. And all those studying the discipline get those special shoes, and we were here as Ashton got his. Okay, my normal shoes. As Ashton develops this new skill. It takes a particular like type of strength that the girls spend years to work on. The Pacific Northwest Ballet is learning too. If we're not listening and learning and keeping up, um, we're no longer relevant. In Seattle, DD Sun, Cairo 7 News. Cairo 7 is committed to tackling topics on diversity in our community. And you can find our stories along with resources and ways you can contribute to the conversation at Cairo7.com slash gets real. Thank you for watching this episode of Western Washington Gets Real. If you missed any of these stories, you can always watch them on the Cairo 7 Smart TV app or on Cairo7.com. I'm Monique Minglavin, and we'll see you the next time news breaks.
Cairo 7 News is live, local, in-depth, 24-7. Log on to Cairo7.com and download the Cairo 7 News and Weather apps.